even if you can do, uh, even if you're able to do everything absolutely 100% perfect, you are still going to have uh, the, uh, uh, the successful crime, sadly. And illustration that even President Reagan with full Secret Service uh, protection, that's what happened. So with this, um, personal safety is just not about parking close to your destination, parking near lights, checking your back seat, walking with your keys in your hand. We all know that. What I want to give this presentation about is making a mindset of being aware of uh, this uh, color code is a great uh, example of having a proper mindset. Condition white, unaware and unprepared is really cool where you're just not concerned about your safety or anything. When you're in your home, when the doors are locked, you're, you're in for the evening, you can, you can let your guard down all you want while you're in there. You know, unless there's a knock at the door. Yellow alert is what we want to be in when we're walking, uh, when we're doing our Christmas shopping, when we're outside, we're moving around, we're going to work, we're coming home from work. We want to be just a yellow, relaxed alert. Orange is when you pick up something specific. When you see a, a threat that is potentially going to approach you. Uh, a good example of that, and this, this happened to me, I drove to Walmart uh, one evening with my family. I got out of the car. I ran in. It was at night. I'm coming back out. I picked up a guy that's bearing down on me in the parking lot. So I was at a relaxed alert. I picked up a specific alert because it was kind of one of those deals. He's walking directly towards me and I'm thinking to myself, is he meeting a friend behind me? Is he coming towards me? And then as he started approaching more, I realized his eyes were focused on me. He was coming towards me. He had his hand in his jacket. He was holding something, which I firmly believe was a gun. You know, the last thing I wanted to do is run over to my car and have him confront me and my family together. But as he's coming up, I realize it's specific. Well, I do have some choices. I actually dealt with this at Orange Alert. Uh, what I did is I stopped and I faced him and I looked at him like, what do you want? And he, he's put on the brakes quick and he said, uh, in, in fact, I, I know he was going to, actually, I know it was going to be an armed or a strong arm robbery um, on, on me. And so when I looked at him, he stopped, put the brakes on and he said, uh, um, I, you know, he started fumbling around with his words and said, hey, I ran out of, basically it was, I ran out of gas. Do you have, and he couldn't even think how much money he was going to ask me for, for gas. Uh, he came up with some ridiculous number of 87 cents, and that's because he was so nervous about, about me facing off with him. And then he said, uh, well, I said to him, I said, absolutely not. I'm gonna, not going to give you any money. And I got my cell phone. I said, let me call 911 for you. They can help you. And immediately he took both his hand out of his, his right pocket. Both hands went up in a sign of surrender. He gave me a light cussing, and he walked off. But had he been bearing down on me, I would have had, I would have been condition red. And I added flight because you can, I could have disengaged, gone back into the store as quickly as I could before he got any closer to me. Or if he overwhelmed me, then I have the position of, do I fight? Uh, that's the Jeff Cooper color code. I added flight or to this. But anyway, uh, the Marine Corps actually uses this when they're on uh, patrol. With this, personal safety is about making yourself a less desirable target of crime. To give you a real good idea, a lot of people have heard about crime prevention by environmental design. Well, what that is, is you trim your trees uh, below your windows, you use LED uh, lights, uh, you use, um, you know, you make sure that uh, you have maintenance to your house uh, and you indicate now that you're someone that is crime aware. Maybe you have an alarm or whatever. So you can do that with your body language as well. You have the ability to present yourself as you're going to and fro as 
a, a less desirable target of crime. So that's what we want to learn from this presentation. Ways to make yourself less of a target of crime is just be aware of your environment. Head on a swivel, good posture. You know, you want to think tactically. And when I say think tactically, you want to think about multiple options. Do I want to disengage? How will I respond if someone confronts me? You want to have these many options in your mind as you go. You want to create a reaction time. And that's what I did. When the guy was bearing down on me, I created reaction time by actually squaring up with him and looking like, what do you want? And that created him. Actually, he stopped quite a distance from me. Body language, like a police officer. I have to tell you, in, in all my time as an Oklahoma City police officer, I uh, <clears throat> what I did is uh, I've only, I personally only know of two instances where our officers have been a target of crime off duty. Most often officers, male, female, are not targeted as crime. And it has something to do with the way we present ourselves. So I want to share some typical body language that we use and I've used. And the bad guy has been handled so many times by the police. And sometimes these are um, cues that he picks up. He doesn't even know it. He just knows that this person he's talked to is kind of a, a oh, there's a red line with this person and it's better to disengage. We want those things. Being aware of your surrounding, I want to show you this video. Uh, this is a video that you would think these, this group of people uh, sitting in here in this restaurant are in this lady's purse. If you notice by the woman towards the end, sitting closest to the table where these two other ladies sat down, she's got a bag there. And how safe do you feel? You're there probably with your coworkers. You've got someone at the head of the table. You all are discussing uh, the day's events, and you're going to believe that your purse, your bag, whatever, is going to be safe in a public restaurant. Fortunately, there's this video camera that actually shows what's going on. Now, people that actually, you know, do thievery like this, they don't like to be held uh, with a stolen property, so she hands that up to her friend. Her friend gets the wallet that has the cash and the credit cards in it, probably dumps that uh, wallet over there, and then these ladies decide we're going somewhere else. This is going to be a huge mystery. To, did I leave my purse at, at work? Uh, did I bring it in? Is it in the car? Only to discover, really, that it was stolen right in the middle of a restaurant during a, what looks like a business lunch. So again, we want to be aware of our surroundings because many things go on beyond that. Are we someone that really recognizes danger? And I love this little picture, this little guy. Well, they kind of look like me. They've got four legs, you know, and I'll just wander up and see, uh, see what's going on. You know, the truth is we want to be aware of what looks like danger and we would like to avoid it. But if you're just, you know, a condition white, you're just kind of oblivious to all that. So we want to know that predators, they will stalk a location. It's really all about surveillance and counter surveillance when you're, when you're talking about um, personal safety. Bad guys do, yeah, sometimes there's a target of opportunity, but most often uh, the thieves, whether it's a personal attack or a property attack, have really done their homework. So what you have here are I don't know if you can see that vehicle, but in this um, vehicle down at the bottom, you know, you've got a guy with his binoculars. Would you notice that? In, in the middle screen, we have a guy that's approaching this uh, female and, you know, would she have noticed him? Now, this is a teenage girl. You know, would you have noticed the danger of, before he got that close to you and would you run off? And then the, le the next picture is a guy that's doing his surveillance. If people are staring at you, you know, with their eyes looking direct at, directly at you, or you might see them staring at other people, <laughs> there's a reason for that. You know, they're gaining intelligence. They're assessing you. They're assessing the situation. Who are the people around? And this is what we really, and I'll just cut to the chase. You want to call 911 on all these incidents. Now, 
you know, you might, if you see someone parked out in the parking lot and they've got binoculars and they're watching the mall, they're watching people, they're watching one of your neighbors, they're watching your, um, you know, all these things. 911, what's your emergency? Well, you know, there's a guy out here in a van. You want to give the best description, two-tone vehicle. You, there's a man in there with a long sleeve denim uh, shirt on. Uh, he's got black hair, white male, and he's got binoculars and he's watching someone. Can you send an officer to check that out? That's how we cut down on these things. And again, uh, sadly, this middle picture is the girl is Carly Brucia. She actually was abducted by this man and it was caught on uh, camera. But if you're driving by and you see what looks like a strange confrontation, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to call. It, it really doesn't for us to check the area. And then you've got to ask yourself again with this other guy, why is he bird dogging? Why is he over there staring at people as they go? And you look for that. Now, if someone's just normally watching the day, Maybe doing a little people watching, that's fine. But when they're doing the bird dog, which I call that, uh, you know, it's okay to go ahead and ask us to check it out. They're gathering intelligence. They're stalking for a potential uh, victims. And they're seeing if they can go unnoticed. And if you notice these people, if they're looking at you and you stop and you eye lock with them briefly, they're going to write you off their list as a potential target because you saw them. They're looking for people that they completely go unnoticed. Their predator strengths, they know people will not call 911 when stalking a location or a target. We hear that all day. People call up to us and they, in their, you know, oh, we want to report, but we didn't want to call 911. 911 is the gatekeeper to our officers in enforcement, not the division or not detective division, you know, not the helicopter unit, not the canine unit. We want all our calls to go through 911 if, for, to be checked out. That is the most efficient thing that, that you can do to protect yourself and others. And they also know that typically the police are only call, called after they can do an attack or their crime. So they've got a safety window and they can disengage if they don't like what they see, but we'd like to check these people out. Uh, they follow a plan that they're used to and they can abort if they don't like the victim they've selected, just like the guy that was coming up to me. And incidentally, I did call 911 on that guy. As soon as I got back to my car and the guy who left, I said, hey, can you send a unit out? I gave the description and all that. So I just didn't let that go. Uh, so that's what we want to do. We, we want to get ahead of the predator. Their weaknesses, they do have internally a desire to get away with the crime. They're wanting to get away with this crime and go unnoticed and as long as they can. And they know they've got a good window when people call 911 after they've struck. They need timing to attack the victim and escape. That is always on their mind. Uh, they're constantly concerned with discovery. Again, you protect your neighborhood. A mall will protect its mall. A business will protect its business. If you actually call on, give good calls on descriptions of suspicious people acting suspicious. Now, I have to tell you, along with that, a flamed out gang member, you know, is a gang member. He's a gang member. He knows he's a gang member. But the guy's just walking through your neighborhood to A to B. That is not really a 911 call, because if you think that's the only danger to your neighborhood, what you're going to do is you're going to miss the burglar or the personal predator that is wearing a, a polo shirt and slacks. OK, if you if you think that's what it is. But if the gang member or the, or the guy that looks really nice is stopping and looking in between your house, looking in your in your neighbor's cars or your cars, are walking up on property lines beyond the street or sidewalk area. Those are the people we want the calls on. If they look like they're a lookout, they're standing and they're looking both left and right. Maybe you saw two guys with them. One guy's in the back of the residence doing the burglary. Those are the calls that are excellent on suspicious people. They tend to be overconfident and they 
most can underestimate the victim they choose. No, I think I was, I was chosen as a victim at Walmart because I'm older, you know? And so he saw me uh, coming out, looks like a pretty good victim. I'll, uh, you know, uh, I'll just get this well, guy. But what I did was completely unexpected when I turned on him and, uh, and uh, you know, he engaged me verbally. Command bearing. This is, this is one of the most important things that you can do. And if you're not naturally like, <laughs> if, if you're not naturally uh, like a person that has a great deal of strength or power, when you put it off, you can learn it. You don't have to be that person. You can learn it. It's the most important trait for a police officer is that command bearing. When I first got down here, I saw... I, I want, well, to give you an idea, I've seen officers that are six foot two, they just got out of the academy, all their uniform fits perfectly, shined up, they look great, they're six two, they've got broad shoulders, strong, you know, that looks like they could do push-ups all day, and I've watched an uh, old cranky bad guy actually make them, their voices crack and stutter when they're brand new, and I've watched smaller you know, uh, the guy that trained me had a little pot belly, which I have one now, as a matter of fact. But, you know, he had a little pot belly and uh, he, he, he kind of looked like an elf. But I got to tell you, he could turn on this strength and this power uh, that, would, that would make big, big hardened criminals take a step back. That's command bearing. It doesn't matter if, you know, you're, you're big, short, small, whatever what you look like, male, female, it doesn't matter. If you have that strength and purpose, you know, in you, uh, it, it radiates. And that's what we want to learn. And I'll give you some examples and tools of that. If you don't have command, command bearing, you can learn how to get it or act like you have it. Everyone knows someone that has command bearing. Uh, and I have to tell you, really all you have to do, no matter what age you are, you think back to when you were in high school, wasn't there that teacher, that counselor, that female that was maybe be, maybe in her 50s or 60s, she wasn't very big, gray hair, and she had just, you know, all, at my high school at Northwest Class, and there was a gal, uh, count, or she was a vice principal, Hazel Smiley. And I'm telling you, she could walk down that hall and the hardness kids, or I was a good kid. You know, I still just felt the strength come for that woman. And whenever she covered a class, there was no talking in her class, you know. So, so again, everyone knows someone that's got that strong command bearing. Arming yourself, arming yourself for a confrontation good posture, walk purposefully, scan while walking. And I gotta, I've got to tell you this, um, my wife's an ER nurse and she works a 12 hour shift. I work an eight hour shift. So I have the luxury of taking her to work, going to work, getting off work and going to pick her up. She gets door side service and she loves it and I love doing it. But uh, I oftentimes will look at people and think to myself, is this a, is this a, um, a good victim or a bad victim? Because I'm always, I'm always studying. You know, I was a, um, a high school teacher. So I'm always thinking like a teacher and in, in getting information. So I happened to be one time, I was in my personal car. I was wearing just regular clothes and I was watching the, um, the employee exit by the emergency room. And I'm probably about, you know, uh, 50 yards. I mean, I'm back a ways, but I'm watching the door. And I see the first nor uh, nurse come out. And first thing she, you know, reaches into her purse, gets a cell phone, head down. She's rope, just walking to her car, which she's done a thousand times, neither looking left or right. She just head down, looking at the parking lot, talking to whoever on the phone. I'm thinking... Oh my goodness, you know, sadly, that's a good victim. I saw that with like three, four nurses in a row. All of a sudden, the door opens up and this nurse walks out. And when she walks out, she scans the parking lot. 
And I'm actually over in, uh, uh, not in the parking lot proper, um, where the ambulances come in, I'm just kind of parked to the side. She picks up my car because that's unusual that there's a car there and I can, I already know what she's thinking. She picks it up and she could see me, but not clearly. She can see it at that distance that it's an occupied vehicle. She stands there and I see her lean forward and squint her eyes, trying to, trying to discern who I am. When she did, I could feel my power leaving me. I, could, I, I was thinking, oh my gosh, she thinks I'm probably a weirdo, you know, watching this entrance. And she just, this was just briefly, she took a good look, but I could feel myself go on the defensive, even in the car that far away from her. And so what I was thinking was, she's not my victim. She's looking around, she's picked me up already, my vehicle, and maybe she can see me better than I think she can. Then she starts walking to her car, head, good posture, and she's walking to the parking lot. She stops and takes one more look. I'm going, there is no way anyone's going to sneak up on her and she's going to be a problem. So that's what we want to do when we scan, when we walk. I would challenge, sometimes you will pick that person up that is bird dogging you, that is eye looking at you. And it's sort of a challenge. And most typically, if you're walking and you look, don't be afraid of it. Look eye to eye at that person briefly. The normal response, and I've done this a million times myself, and I've taught this to my kids, you know, is you make that eye look, they look away, then you look away. The challenge is over. It's kind of like that nurse. She eye lock challenged me when she came out and picked me up in my car. So she eye lock challenged me and then went on and then looked one more time, looked away and went on. The challenge was over and I have to say she won. There's no doubt about it. The other thing is the look. And this is really, really important is this look that you can develop. It, is, it, it sends a message. So let me show you some great examples of what this looks looks like. That's the look. That is, <laughs> that's the look. And that reminds me of the counselor I told you about, you know, in my high school. You know, they're about the same age and actually resemble one another. It's not her, but that's the look. Here's another look. Here's a youthful person. Now, she is, she's coiled up a bit. And she's actually, believe it or not, she has a boxer stance. She's got a shoulder up, she's tucking her chin, and she's staring, and she's giving a very, that's a warning. That particular look is a warning. Now, here's a woman that is very dignified. She's got her own power. She's someone that is, um, you know, she is presenting that she's someone to deal with. Do not underestimate this woman at all. And then here's a young girl. You know, again, her look, her eyes are, are open, her chin is tilted forward a little bit, and she's looking and sending a message like, what are you thinking of even approaching me? And this, ne this next one is actually a, a new one. She may, th this is actually my um, uh, oldest daughter, and I had a little fun with her, uh, and I taught her all this when she was 14 years old. She was taking this, the things I'm teaching in this presentation to heart, but I had my camera at the ready and this was Thanksgiving. I had a little fun with her. You know, I yelled at her, kind of a challenge. I said, Lauren, don't mess up the whipped cream. And I mean, just that quick, she turned. Now, if you look at her face, you can see her mouth and actually each one of their mouths are dipped down a little bit. She's staring right at me. Like, have I lost my mind even saying that? But this is, a, this is a challenged look, and this is the look. And for you guys out here, Clint Eastwood, he's got about the best look there is. So, you know, just anytime you watch a Clint Eastwood movie and you're getting in the mirror, you know, and guys, if you want to have that look, he has got it at every age of his career. Approach test. Bad guys will often ask a question to determine if you're a good or bad risk. All, when I was in the field for 20 years, I took so many reports 
And I always wondered why the bad guy was bigger, taller, younger, and had a weapon, whether it was a gun or a knife. Why did they go to their victim and ask or say something that was a, that we like, and this is, these, these are real examples that I've, of reports I've taken in armed robbery, two guys went in to a sandwich shop to the two females working because, Hey, we got mud on our feet and we want to uh, wipe them off. Is that okay? I had um, another friend of mine that was confronted in a parking lot like me, walked up to her and said, hey, lady, have you got a light? And she noticed he didn't even have a cigarette, okay, too light. And this was, he was bigger, younger, stronger than her. And she actually diffused it by engaging him in a verbal, pretty tough confrontation as such. Uh, well, actually, when he asked, hey, lady, have you got a light? She looked at him and said, hey, buddy, do I look like a big lighter to you? And he goes, no, ma'am, you don't. And off he went. But again, these test questions are really uh, out there to see if you're a good victim. And sometimes the way you respond to this is really a way that you're able to diffuse the problem. You know, so lead the dance, pull the guy into your world. And this even, in, well, this next example is, is one that's personal to me. And when I say lead the dance, the bad guy is leading this or he expects to lead it. But I've got to show you, this is my grandmother. She was in her 80s. After my grandfather died, she moved to Plano, Texas to be near my aunt, live near my aunt. And she had a two bedroom apartment. Now she's in her 80s, okay? Very small, petite woman. She wakes up in the middle of the night and there's a man at the foot of her bed watching her sleep. He broke in and he, uh, he wasn't stealing her silverware. He wasn't stealing her stereo or whatever. It wasn't a property crime. This was a first degree burglary and he's watching her. She's the target of this crime. So again, how is she going to change this? He's leading the dance by his presence. He's in there, okay? So when she wakes up, and this honestly happened, and when she got through telling the story, you know, I had to be peeled off the ceiling. But she, uh, she threw her covers off when she realized there's a man at the end of my bed staring at me. She goes right up to him and takes him by the arm and looks at him in the face, gets her finger out and says, does your mother know where you are? Does she know where you are and what you're doing? And immediately this guy goes on the defensive. He has, he didn't even know what to say. She goes, you come with me right now. She takes him by the arm and she leads him through her apartment. And she says, she goes, you better never, never hope your mother find out, finds out what you're doing. And you need to get on home right now. She opens the door. He goes through it and he says, I'm sorry, ma'am. And out the door he gets. Now. I don't discount the grace of God, but I can tell you this. She didn't say, I'm, you know, you won't get away with this. I'm going to call the police. You'll go to jail for a year. You know, uh, the, but what she did was she invoked his mother and he didn't expect that. And I'm going to guess that in her, and, but this is, this is my grandmother. This is her a hundred percent. And so what I'm saying is, is, You've got to find that inner strength in yourself in dealing with people like that. And yeah, it's scary, but I'm going to give you some uh, training pointers uh, on how you can actually train for an event like this. Well, here we go. Under stress, this is a truth. Under stress, you're going to revert back what you've been trained to do. Otherwise, you'll be like a deer caught in the headlights. And that's not what you want to be when you're dealing with people that are, are wanting to take your money or attack you, you want to respond in an efficient way. Tactical breathing is something I, I would suggest. This is a free app, Tactical Breather Trainer. If you look that up, it basically, it, it, you know, this is, a, a police officers like anything with the word tactical. So, you know, I got to tell you, it's easy. It's an easy sell. So, you know, tactical breather trainer teaches you under stress. And there's a tutorial on there that explains all this. 
but it's great for if you get in a car wreck and you've got a pretty significant bleed, you're trying, you know, tie that off or you're dealing with someone, you get someone to slow their breathing down. Bring your calm down. Your heart will slow down along with your breathing. It, it brings the adrenaline rush. If you, you, you know, sometimes your adrenaline will spike before you need it. And tactical breathing will help that. If you, if, hey, the boss needs to see you in the office and you feel like your heart rate's going up, you want to start doing your tactical breathing. So tactical breathing is really very, very important. And this trainer will teach you. I taught this to all my children when they were very little, when they got their shots. Me, I was terrified of shots. And I think they would have been too, but I had them focus on me. We started doing our tactical breathing together. They got a shot and they didn't even know it. My oldest daughter, when she was 14, fell off a trampoline, broke her ankle. She was able to control the pain and her shock by the tactical breathing. So I highly recommend this. When you get in a confrontation and you want to think clearly, tactical breathing is very important. Uh, also, let you know, I, we don't, you know, recommend that you throw down in a fight over property. Someone wants your wallet, give it to them, your purse, whatever, that's fine. But if it's going to be uh, armed robber, strong arm robbery, you know, again, give it to them. But, you know, if you're, if it looks like they want to use violence in the weapon against you, whether it's to take your property or to, um, or if you're the target of the violence, you know, you are, then you want to consider fighting. And as we come to the end of this part of the presentation, we'll go into the property crimes. But what we want to do is, is say, do you resist or not in a personal attack? And again, that is a decision you have to make. You know, we can't tell you, because I'll give you an example. I was an adjunct professor at Oklahoma State University, University and taught a hands-on personal safety. And some of the strikes and things we did, I had a religious major that came up to me and she said, I am not comfortable with these techniques. And I said, you don't have to be. You don't even have to use them. If, you know, I, I have no judgment against you on what you want to do. Just learn these techniques to get a grade. And if you're ever attacked personally, you can decide then. You'll have the tools, you know, to strike out and help defend yourself or not. And so again, we, we do not come and say, you always have to, you don't. That is a decision you really should think about before it happens. Again, it's a personal decision, but I'm always asked if you strike an attacker, won't that make them angry? Yes, if it's a half-hearted strike, it probably will. But if you strike strong, hard and true, then that's when you see the predator's mind change and they start going um, they start going on the defensive. Quick lesson, if you decide to resist, you might ask yourself, what can I tell you in the next two minutes? You know, do you need a black belt to defend yourself? And no, you don't. Uh, one thing, what I say, and I'll, and I'll tell you this, in all my time of taking reports on the street, 20 years of it, of victims and incidents, I've never, I've only seen two people that were smaller in stature defeat a larger person with their empty hands, okay? I've seen, I've taken reports where many people survived the incident with very, very little harm to themselves or actually they skated on the whole deal because they had something in their hand when they were fighting uh, off the bad guy. And even in an active shooter situation, I took this slide from that, you're wanting something to use that gives you an advantage. Give you just a quick idea of what I'm talking about. I went to a, uh, uh, it was actually a rape in progress at Prince Hall Apartments a lot of years ago. When I get there, I'm seeing this six foot four guy being loaded up onto a stretcher into an ambulance with his head all wrapped up. And then I'm looking at a petite female you know, with her dress torn 
and uh, she's kind of boohooing and she's she's got a, a good grip on a high heel shoe. So I actually thought this guy might have tried to help her and he got hurt, but I find out he was the predator. He was the attacker. And she, uh, as she's walking, he jumped out and he started all these cat, dirty cat call on this gal. She's just not one to look at this at all. It's scary. He just grabs her and throws her down. And next thing she knows, she's got her high heel shoe in the, in the high heel part of it nails him in the eye, side of the temple, he rolls over, she rolls on top of him and just keeps hammering him with his high heel shoe. Completely knocked him out, broke his jaw, you know, and um, he uh, almost lost that eye. Point is, she was able to defend herself against a larger person with that high heel shoe. It's a, It was a puncturing object. It was kind of a puncturing and also a... Um, a uh, heavy object, you know, as such, you know, an impact object is what we would call. So again, these are things that you can use efficiently. And if you notice on the ink pen, uh, that's probably my favorite. It's a puncturing object. And again, the bad guy never counts on seeing his own blood. So again, these are things that you, you could actually strike with a non-lethal strike, but the bad guy feels it. At first, he'll be in a bit of shock, but then the confusion comes on. And a good example of that, and I love this, age and ruthlessness will beat youth and agility. In this particular incident that I read about, an unidentified 58-year-old woman. Now, this is a woman that's almost 60 years old. She's praying in a Roman Catholic church in Hudson Valley City. And she actually, it was a 24-hour prayer vigil. She's in there late at night. No one else was in there with her during this. You know, people were coming and going and, and praying. So she kind of had this late shift as such. And this predator, when they saw the video and the, and the video capture uh, was put in this church because there'd been a great deal of theft. So that's why the video was in there. But what it caught was this predator. He first came in, sat down. He's much bigger much stronger, much younger than this woman. Again, he's almost 60. And he is as disgusting as that is, he was gonna attack her right in that pew, as, as, as horrible and disgusting as that is. He's shoving her over, trying to get on top of her, and guess what? She's writing in her journal with um, a pen. And next thing you know, if you can see the way her hand is, it's a, what we call an ice pick grip, boom, right into his neck, and actually out the door he went. It was over. She nailed him really good and she survived this incident. So this gives you an incident, again, I mean an example of where someone much older uh, than, and the attacker is bigger, stronger, younger, is attacking her and she successfully defended herself with a puncturing object, which happened to be an ink pen. So again, these are kind of the things we're talking about. Everyone used to say, you know, those keys wrapped up. When I walked in my car with all my keys, that's not really efficient. And we really recommend you get away from that mindset. Yeah, it was kind of trendy at one time, but that's not what we want. You want to have a winning mind. You're a person of worth. You might get hurt or wounded, but you will survive. That is the mindset. Never give up. Okay, now as we move on to property crimes, burglary. Types of burglary. First degree burglary is when someone breaks in, uh, you know, when the person is inside the house, when it's an occupied dwelling. Second degree burglary, same thing, when they break in and it is not occupied, when you're gone to work or whatever. Penalties, first degree burglary is very serious. Okay, it's a 20 year prison sentence and that uh, even goes higher if you bring a gun or a weapon, a weapon like that when you're committing the first degree. Second degree burglary is still a felony. Seven years in prison is the penalty on that. First degree burglary most often occurs when homeowners are asleep. It's really a thrill crime to break in when the person is still in there. Like, like my, my grandmother, as I was saying, believe it or not, that would have been a thrill crime for this guy. Uh, they purposely enter your home while it's occupied. Sometimes they are armed. 
may leave evidence to frighten the home owner for excitement. Sometimes actually a first degree burglar will break in and not take anything. They'll leave something because it's such a thrill. But if you wake up or you encounter them, that's when the situation can be very dangerous. Uh, you know, this type of burglary is very rare, but it's only important to let you know they do occur. Home invasion is still a first degree burglary. Typically the home invasion uh, is, is a violent entry. It's an explosive entry where more than one person rushes in and assaults the residents, ties them up, takes their time, steals their property, uh, and a lot of times their car keys and their car. Most often occurs late evening or nighttime hours. Entry is commonly made by a knock at the door with only one person visible. Okay, when the person opens it, now I gotta tell you, reading significant incidents is always the man most often it's always the man in the middle of the night. And I read this, some guys much older than me, you know, hear the doorbell ring at two in the morning and they go and open it up. Who's there? And they're, they're rushed by these criminals. Uh, very, we have more incidents where women do not open up, look up and say, what do you want through the door? And that actually takes care of it. You know, they will report that to 911 you know, hey, there was some strange person knocking on my door in the middle of the night. So the, the real key here is not to open that door in the middle of the night. That is number one. Um, second degree burglary usually occurs during the daytime, occasionally happens uh, at nighttime if the homeowners are away from home or on vacation. And again, they find that out by doing their surveillance. One or two subjects unarmed, Careful to ensure no one is at home. Normally what they will do, this happens during the day most often because people are at work. They'll knock on the door and if no one answers, they go around, they go around to the back of the house, break out a window or kick the door in. Now it's important to know that some people, this turns into a first degree burglary because someone's at home, sick, doesn't feel good, <coughs> doesn't feel good. There's a knock at the front door. They don't want to deal with it. Bad guy thinks no one's at home. They go in the back door. The burglars and the homeowner confront each other. Both of them run away as fast as they can from each other. So, I, again, these are property crimes, and they, they really try to go out of their way not to invade the home when someone is there. And, again, they'll make their exit through the front or side door. Secondary burglary. Uh, most violated rooms in a secondary burglary or is the master bedroom or bedrooms, living room, least violated rooms are kitchen, laundry room. I don't know how many of these reports I've taken when people, you get there and the house is absolutely a disaster and the kitchen laundry room have not been touched. So before I actually got a gun safe, if I went on vacation, I would put all my guns in the washer and dryer. And I pretty much knew that if someone burglarized my house, they'd be safe there. Um, second degree burglary, again, most property taken is electronics, jewelry, money, guns, pillowcases, pillowcases, because they load up stuff in the pillowcases. Uh, recently, my daughter, the one you saw the picture of, this is interesting, this is where she lives. My wife was actually watching uh, my grandson while she was all week at the school with, with um, my granddaughter, older granddaughter. Uh, my wife every day would take him like clockwork at 9.30 to a local McDonald's to play. Well, after about three days of doing this in a row, she comes back home, and this is an overhead view of the house, and this is the backyard for reference. When she comes back, she gets in, she finds the break-in. Someone threw a brick through the back window, came in to the uh, living room, ransacked the house, taking guns, jewelry, you know, all kinds of things, real hard property. And you look at this, and so you wonder, how did they know she wouldn't be there? Well, looking back at this, actually, 
bad guys now, there's a trend now where they'll doing their surveillance, they'll go to a McDonald's, a grocery store, they'll find a victim they liked. They happen to notice my wife would show up with my grandson like clockwork, you know, at about 945. She'd leave this house at 930, 945. She was at McDonald's. She'd stay there about an hour and come home just like routine. Well, there so happened to be a person that drove a neighbor a couple of days later, my, my uh, daughter put on the social media about this burglary. And a lady said, oh my gosh, I saw a van in your driveway and they were offloading her TV, her big screen TV set, okay, at 945. Now, again, they knew like clockwork, all they had to do is find, and there was no serial burglar working the, her neighborhood. That was another thing. So what you have is sometimes criminals will pick up victims from one location, go back there and see if there's a routine. They were there 15 minutes after my uh, wife left with my grandson. And they knew they pretty much easily had a good hour to commit this burglary. So again, we want to be aware, mindful of who's around us and what they're doing. Auto burglaries most often occur at night in a residence, daytime in parking lots or work or shopping centers, unlike vehicles or breaking into driver's passenger window if they see the property inside. Suspects tend to live close to the neighborhood, but there's a new trend. Burglars are now leaving and they are shopping in neighborhoods they want to hit doing their surveillance. That's when we want to be aware and we want to lock our doors and not leave property in. These are, this is some of the property that we've looked at from auto burglaries in unlocked cars, guns, electronics, wallets, cash money, purses, medication, cell phones, you wouldn't believe it. And sometimes car keys. We had one neighbor that was hit. The husband left his car keys in and left um, and on it, the key ring with his wife and both cars were stolen. Items uh, bought from the store like during Christmas, they are big time targets. As we come to the end of this presentation, how most burglars are caught, video, serial numbers is really wonderful at pawn shops when they try to fingerprints, pawn shop reports, uh, packages theft. They do surveillance on trucks, neighborhood target parks. They're, people are driving your area looking at, and this is when we want to pick them up. The best time to call 911 on a porch part is during their surveillance. When they're following and stopping, you know, while a de delivery truck is in your neighborhood, when stopping and watching a house in your neighborhood, these are the times to call in to have us come and try to engage them. Uh, when a person commits this kind of theft is when it's in progress. You know, uh, they most always walk very calmly to the porch and we watch all the videos that are sent to us on these thefts. Security cameras help but you know they're not really deterrent because we have all these videos of these porch pirates that communicating with 911 make sure you let the dispatcher know whether it's in progress or if if they are following the truck or looks like they're stalking uh, your neighborhood give location description of suspects um, and their vehicle prevention Plan to have your packages delivered to your work, neighborhood, or local businesses. I know FedEx will deliver it at your local Walgreens. You can go up there, sign for it, and get it. Ask, you can ask that your delivery is signed for. Amazon Prime has a garage delivery uh, service where available, where they do background checks of the uh, they do background checks of the uh, uh, deliverers. They will have a one-time code that they check in with that will raise your garage door. They're only allowed three feet in there and they will drop off your package and the door will close. And again, you can get, a, it's a little expensive. It's around 80 bucks, but you can get a locked porch package drop box. Again, as I close this presentation, you contact your 
uh, police community relations officer, simply type in your search engine, OCPD PCR, break PCR. That brings up this link and you can click on it and what it will bring up is our police communities web page which is which is great is what we want to do okay with that are there any questions because we're rent at about the golden hour but we'll entertain a couple uh, questions if someone needs to jump off that's cool but uh just let us know and if, Anna, is there any, any questions as such? I do not see any questions. To say, kind of as I, as I close out, uh, thank you again. Thank you again for coming here. I hope the presentation, uh, you know, met some needs. Also, it was recorded by Neighborhood Alliance, and they will post that. If you want to share that information with your friends or family and say, hey, check this out, it was useful, please um, look at it later. And I just want to thank everyone and hope you have a very safe uh, and Merry Christmas.